Rio de Janeiro. With a big man. Welcome to Frio de Janeiro. This is a big man. On this episode, we'll be joined by Tim Vickery, also known as the Legendino for his exploits on the BBC World Football Phone In, a world famous football podcast. He is one of the finest football journalists I've had the pleasure of keeping up to date with over the years. He's just a fantastic and engaging guy, as you'll hear in the interview. Tim has a really interesting journey that starts in London and has led him to living in beautiful Rio de Janeiro and having the awesome role as BBC's South American football correspondent. This show is going to be an absolute treat for football fans. Even beyond that, Tim goes into real depth about Brazil and the social context. Things are quite tough in Brazil as we recorded this, so a really big thank you to Tim for making time. I really hope this conversation resonates with you, so please enjoy. Tim Vickery, the legend Dino, it's an absolute pleasure to have you join me on Frio de Janeiro, and uh, i got to start by saying I'm extremely pumped because I've been listening to the World Football Phone-In for so long. I've been a football fan for since I was a child, and some of my earliest memories of you would be watching SBS and uh, 2006 World Cup, the Socceroos were drawn against Brazil, and Les Murray, the late Les Murray, the legend, was actually on the phone with you and you were providing a bit of an update to Australians about the Brazil team and how we could potentially beat them. I was feeling so empowered, (laughs) feeling like, (laughs) okay, let's let's beat those Brazilians now. You were Mm. talking about the outball to Cafu and Roberto Carlos and how we had to defend that. I I just love the way you describe football and you provide a social construct, a, a context around the game. So really excited to speak to you about your journey. And I love to Maybe start at the very beginning. What are some of the first football memories you have? Well, I was in a way I was kind of born into it because uh, uh, my my old man was uh, a nearly man. You know, sport was was his life, and he, he was much older than he was born in twenty four. So he was much older than the the, the parents of my contemporaries, uh, and he and he didn't get married and 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 have me until he was gone forty which in those days was very, very rare indeed. And really the reason for that was he, could, he couldn't get in the Second World War. Couldn't get in um, because he, he, he was short-sighted. And I'm short-sighted, but he was very short-sighted. So they wouldn't let him in the Army, the Air Force, and, and, and any of that. And that was just humiliating for him. It killed off any possibility he had, really, of, of making anything of his life. And he was in something called the Home Guard, which was like a defence force for old, mainly for old people. Um, for too old for the regular arm, and he worked in the Woolwich Arsenal during the daytime. And uh, that was such a humiliation for him because he was an athletic bloke, my dad, and his his schoolmates were going off to fight and die for their country, and he couldn't get in the war. And he, he, he used sports, and he loved it anyway, but he used it as a, as, a, as a platform to show that he was just as good as anyone else. You know, it, it it took on almost too important, too much importance for him. I think playing as a player, you know, playing football in in the winter uh, and and cricket in the summer, and he was a nearly man. He had I think he had trials for Charlton Athletic at football, and he was recommended to one of the counties here at Hampshire for for cricket, but he wasn't quite good enough. And I was his first son, so I, I was born with this almost like obligation to fulfil his dreams for him, uh, and uh, it. it very quickly became apparent that although I'd inherited the enthusiasm, I hadn't inherited any of the talent at all. So, and he used to go and watch me playing football when I was little, eight, nine, ten years old, and he's shaking his head on the on the touchline. Um, so I, I knew that I was never going to make it as a. I was never. It was never going to be my living playing football. But I loved it, and I, I just played all the time. And uh, I've got such early memory and you know the first games you watch on tv and and listening on the radio and football on the radio is so terrifying because every attack you know especially from the other team every attack is is is, is pregnant with, with with danger um but my, my, most of my early memories are up playing they're playing in the park wanting to be better being crap but trying hard um but i owe it so much because um it, it socialized me you know any group of kids you just throw them a ball and they can be friends like that. Mm. And that was my case. You know, all of me, me, me my, my friendships were, were through, through playing football. Um, it gave me 
uh, I'm talking about my old man. He he uh, reached the grand old age of 84. He never got further than a weekend in Dublin, in Ireland. Wow. But we knew all about the world because of football. You know, I, I didn't make it abroad until I was in my mid-23, the first time I went abroad. But, you know, I, I could spell Czechoslovakia <laughs> when I was like eight. They'd been to two World Cup finals, you know. So uh, it gave me a knowledge of the world. It gave me a knowledge of how to get on with other people. So right from the start, it, 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 it's been been very, very important in, in, in my life in lots of ways, in physical ways, in academic ways. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know what would have happened to me without football. It, it, it's almost, it's impossible to imagine um, without wh- how my life would have de- developed without football. There's so much there that I like to go into, but I, I guess what were your formative memories going into stadiums to watch football? I, I didn't go very much. Um, my again, yes, football is a. When I was little, I didn't go very much. Football is a very much a father to something, and uh, well, firstly, my dad worked in a shop. Um, by the time I, uh, we were older, and he didn't get Saturday, he worked Saturdays, so he didn't have many opportunities to go. Uh, and you know, he did take me a few times in the. Um, so this would be. I was born in '65, so we're talking kind of early to mid '70s. But he he absolutely hated what it had become. It had, it, had, it had become quite aggressive. It had become very partisan. Uh, and, and my dad, he, 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 was in, he couldn't really be a supporter. He didn't have that supporter mentality. He loved the game. Mm. And nominally, he was, a, he was a Tottenham fan, but he wasn't really. He, he just loved watching, watching football. Uh, and, and so those early experiences through him, I think I was a bit scared. And, and it, it is scary. It can be scary. It, 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 it's, it's like strong beer, you know. Football. If you if you just watched it on TV in the comfort of your own home, and then you're there, and it, there's just so much noise, and you're that hard, you're tiny, you little, and everyone is like three times bigger, and and uh, there's you can feel that aggression in the air. So uh, early on, it was it was a bit it was a bit too much for me to take. I think some of the, some of those those times when I was when I when I when I was and when I got a little bit older, kind of adolescence, it was at a time when um, music was really kicking in England. You know, I'm talking about the the punk scene and after punk two tone. There was so much music going on. And at that time football and music occupied totally different spheres. So that was one point in my life when football wasn't as important. I did go from time to time, but it, it wasn't as important to my identity from the ages of maybe fourteen up to twenty one. And I'll tell you why twenty one. Because I was at college 21, the 86 World Cup. And the 86 World, World Cup is crucial to me. And by this time, music had, had lost something. It, had, it, it, it wasn't quite as exciting. It wasn't quite as, as vital and relevant, the music scene. Uh, and um, in the build-up to the 86 World Cup, I started to feel the itch again, the real football itch. I was always interested. I was always watching games, and I, I was still playing. But it didn't dominate my thoughts in the way it had when, it, when, it, when, I, was, when I was younger. And suddenly, being at college surrounded by people not only from all over my country but from all over the world it it just it you know and so that 86 world cup which was a fantastic world cup i've got so many vivid memories of watching the games and then i, I think it was it was a you know i didn't do a great deal in college anyway but this was a you, i think we'd done most of the exams or something so you, you just play all day you know so i could play in the daytime and then watch the games in the evening and uh, suddenly all of that passion for football came back and after that, after 86, it was then hard to keep me out of the stadium. But by that time, I was 21. So, um, yeah, I mean, so my, my earlier experiences, uh, probably less, a lot less than 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 some other football fans my age. Because I didn't go that much when I was a kid. Uh, and I wasn't as, quite as interested when I, when I was an adolescent. So you mentioned at that time, music uh, took a little bit more of a back seat. And then how did football and music, going from that point, help you to forge your identity? How did they come together and fuse? They're completely different parts. They're separate for me. Um, and I, I think you can do this, as we said, like football is so much father to son, and it, were, it was in my case. So a lot of football is a, that part of me that is my dad, or there is a connection, you know, because the way that I approach football, the way that I try and look at football, uh, and as I said, my dad was very dispassionate. He couldn't, he couldn't support ones. He couldn't really do it. You know, he'd, he'd always been, oh yeah, that player on the other side, he's fantastic, isn't it? Look at, look at the way he just, he just killed that ball with his left foot. <laughs> and that, that's, that, that's my approach to football as well. You know, so that part of me, which is football, 
is the part of me which which th- th- there's my dad in there. The part of me which is music and clothes is the part of me that has nothing to do with me, Dad. It's that 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 stage that we all have to go through when we create our own identity, you know. And my dad, as I said, he was born in twenty four, so he was he was much too old for youth culture when youth culture kind of broke out in the in a, the, the kind of late fifties in, in in my country. He's already too old for that. So um, our relationship was was it was difficult for for a long time because he just didn't understand me, he didn't understand the things that I was getting into, and and uh, so uh, for me that they're, they're still that they still occupy totally different different parts of me you know the the, the the football is like i was born into it the music and the clothes it's like me it's my 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 positive decisions to, to, to take that path when you were 23 you left england for the first time where was I that did, too? yeah i went to portugal went to portugal it was a group of mates we went to uh went to the algarve in portugal uh, and I, I, loved, I loved it i just loved it i remember stepping off the plane thinking wow that heat that warm air that's great we'll have some of that and i just got it just opened my mind up we're only we rented there was i don't know about 10 of us or something like that we'd rented a kind of villa and i'd never seen architecture like that you know i mean hang on there's a front door and there's a back door but they're not at the same level like the back (laughs) door is like higher and things like that just just did me head in and and it was it was uh, it was it was a great it was a great experience even though we were just drinking and larking around with a bunch of english idiots you know it was it was still it it was still great and it it lit the fire for 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 more 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 foreign travel yes for sure and portugal and and the portuguese that you speak now did that have any any influence whatsoever None. None whatsoever. Um, so firstly, because Portugal from Brazil and, and, and Portuguese from Brazil and Portuguese from Portugal are different languages. You know, they really, really are. And Portuguese from Portugal just sounds like it's Slavonic, you know, it's like something from, Sla- something from Stalin's Russia. They don't, don't, don't open their mouths for crying out loud. I know lots of Brazilians who've gone over to Portugal and ended up saying to the people, look, can you just speak English? Because I can't understand a word you're saying, you know. Um, so no, that there, there was no instant attraction with the with with the, the Portuguese language from Portugal. That more happened when I started me- to meet Brazilians, and then the musicality of, of of the language is is is, is sensational, and it it kind of carried me along. I was actually talking to a Brazilian friend who said that there was a coach from Portugal uh, in one of the divisions in in Brazil, and. When they do a press conference, they actually had subtitles. <laughs> yeah, subtitles. Yeah, there, there, there's a couple of Portuguese coaches over, and they're quite often subtitled, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just impossible. They're, they're, they're not open their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's move to – I'm interested in the variety of jobs you had after school. Uh, you were doing quite a few different things, if we could walk us through those. Yeah, well, you know, I was uh, – it's like being – because I, I was a, was a, a council estate kid – who went up through the education system and when you're in that situation you don't fit in there's nowhere naturally for you to go you gotta you gotta find your own path and and the only way of doing that is is just to see just to to experiment i mean uh i i was um left school at 18 i was going to get a job in a local paper because I'd had the idea of why not why not be a journalist i can write there aren't there aren't honestly there aren't many things i can do you know, I can't do anything with my hands. And, that, and that, that's what me, my contemporaries were good at. You know, they were good at doing things with their hands. Mm. So they're going to they're gonna uh, go and do practical things that make the world a better place. You know, all I can do is like talk and, and, and write. Um, so what, what am I going to do? Uh, so I was lined up to get a job on a local paper. But this is 1983, which is big recession time. So the local paper closed. So I look for a job. And then I found a job in a, in a shop selling clothes, selling men's clothes, which was great because I didn't have that many and I didn't have much money. So, you know, we just take the stock home. It was brilliant. It was, it was a, it was a, a, a wonderful boost in my wardrobe. Um, and I'd kind of always imagined myself working in a shop, you know, my dad had ended up doing it and I thought, yeah, I, I just imagined that that's what I would do with my life. Thankfully, and I blessed the day that shop went bust too. So I had to think of something else to do. And I, I had all the exams. I had the pieces of paper. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go to university. I'd, I'd, ne- I'd never wanted to go before because I didn't understand the language. You know, every little world has its own language. Mm. And university in England is full of, like, vocabulary that kind of only applies to university. So if you're not born into it, you just don't know what's going on. You know, I remember a- 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 attending this meeting when at school when they were talking about going to university. And they kept using these words that I'd never heard of. So I thought, no, I'm not going to do this. Uh, 
<laughs> um, but you know, been out, out out into the world of work and seeing it wasn't very easy. And, and then you know, it wasn't even free in those days. They paid you to go. You know, it was uh, you know I got a grant, so it was all it was all you know they paid me to go. So my thinking then was, well, you know, let's let's just go and avoid the labour market for three years. Um, there was no great academic quest, but again, it turned out to be the best thing I ever did because uh, you know, it gets me get got you me away from home which is important. You've got to break that link at some time. And, and afterwards it's hard to go back. You know, I feel sorry for today's kids. So many of them have to go back because they can't afford the rent that, that, that is charged these days. Uh, and uh, still some of my closest friends are from that period. And we're all a bit first generation university kids. So we're all a little bit lost together. And after university, Christ, what am I going to do now? You know, and then a, a few mates are in a similar situation. I thought, well, why don't we why don't we get together and, and form a magazine? Why don't we found a magazine? It was like a way really of trying to continue student life, really. You know, because we'd we'd spend nights just sitting around a sitting around a sitting in a bar, uh, cracking jokes and amusing each other. Or well, we can do that and try and try and make that into a into a profession. So um we 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 founded this magazine. It was a comedy magazine. Uh, and uh, it, there was a government scheme where you, you, you could get you could get paid for doing it. Not very much, but you could you could, you could get paid for doing it, which was which was great. And uh, we we hired something. It was very very new at the time. You might well have heard of it. It's called a computer. <laughs> and we hired one of, one of them, and uh, we kind of you know designed the uh, on a desktop desktop publishing type thing, and then took it down to printers, uh, and then went all around the country uh, to colleges knocking on doors and trying to sell it. We, and it wasn't a lot of fun, to be honest. It, and, and, you know, we, we went very, very hungry. Um, and uh, we went bust quite early. But a, a, a big comedian, a fellow by the name of Rory Bremner um, in England, he got in touch and he said, uh, well, come on, I've got a new, I really like your magazine. I've got a new series at the BBC. Come and write for me. So we thought, fantastic. This is great. And then we're in these comedy meetings with other other writers, and I realised that I couldn't do it. I just, it was it just wasn't funny. It wasn't good. You know what's the point? Is there anything in you in life which is more useless than a comedy writer who's not funny? <laughs> so uh, no, I, I walked away. I couldn't do that. That it was it was just absolute torture. Um, and I had no idea what to do. And I was, you know, just sleeping on friends' settees and stuff, you know, which wasn't that uncommon for, for, for people of the, people of, of my generation. Of, you know, that was, it was a phase that you went through. And then, you know, it's always who you know, isn't it? Um, I had an old mate who, uh, a college mate, who um, was into theatre. I, I had no connection with theatre whatsoever. Um, but she said, and she worked in a theatre in the West End of London, which is the, the, the centre of London. And she said, you know, you need some work. We need someone part time. Why don't you why don't you come come on down? And I did. And I ended up staying for years and uh, I ended up, you know, I worked there full time five. I was the theatre manager for for a few years at the end. And uh, it was a kids theatre in the day and an adults theatre in the evening. Now, the the, the actual theatre itself, give or take, I'm not really into it. But what, what I loved was being there. In, in that environment, right in the centre of London, it's one of the most international areas in the world. So I'm in contact with people from all over the world. And we had a bar downstairs and the bar was full of Brazilians. And that's where I discovered Brazil. That, that Because uh, we, 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 had some, we had some unbelievable parties there. We had some fantastic parties. It was like the last days of Rome. You know, there were things going on there that really shouldn't have gone on in a children's <laughs> theatre, but why not? You know, and it was great. And I, I fell in love with it and I got curious. And, uh, you know, one day I knew, I knew one Brazilian and the next day I knew 200. Um, and uh, I, I realised that that job I had, it was great. It was, it, honestly, I look back on that. That's the early 90s I'm talking about, the early to mid 90s. I look back on those days as being some of the happiest days of my life, but I knew it couldn't last forever. So I had to, you know, I had to think of something else. And I started getting curious about Brazil and I realized how little we actually know about it, certainly knew about it back then. So the idea started to form in my mind. And just to give myself a backup, I did a course to qualify as a, as a, as a language teacher. So I could teach English to, you know, and I did that as a backup. Came over to Brazil in 93 and had a three week recce and a look around uh, and thought, yeah, all right, I'll come back. We'll do that. We'll do that. So that's going to be the plan. You know, I'm going to, I came back soon after the world cup in 1994, 
with no real plan other than, yeah, it will all be easy. You know, when you're young, you're so naive, bloody stupid, really, when I think about it. But you need that naivety. If not, you wouldn't do anything, you know, because you just you just see the risks. Um, so uh, when and when I come over in, in night for 93 for three weeks, they still had this thing going on called hyperinflation, which meant if you were carrying hard currency, you were richer every day. I thought, this is brilliant. I live like a king. I didn't know. I just walked into a trap. But when I came back, two, three weeks after, uh, you know, just a few weeks after the World Cup, they'd introduced this new currency. They still have it, the, the Hiao, which at that time, it was pegged artificially high. It was, it, was, it was worth more than the dollar. So that money I had, it just went whoosh. And I had really hard times. I managed to get pick up some work teaching English just to tide me over. But the first few months were, were just so miserable. I went hungry and, you know, there were, there were plenty of days where I couldn't eat. It was awful. The only thing that stopped me going back was it was winter in England. Imagine going back in winter with no money and no job and having to, having to turn up humiliated. No. So we're going to stick, stick this out. But right from the start, I was, you know, right from the very first game that I went to, in, in in Brazil, I thought, this is fascinating. This is great. There's so much here. There's so much. I mean, at, at that time, the level of domestic Brazilian football was much higher than it is today because the players didn't go abroad so early. Mm. You know, so my my very first, the first game, I saw Savio, who ended up at Real Madrid, who, who was amazing that day. I mean, the next game, I saw Robert, Roberto. I saw Roberto Carlos. You know, I'm thinking... How has no one discovered this fella? He's a phenomenon. Rivaldo played the same day, you know, and uh, um, there was uh, Edgemundo there as well, you know. And, uh, and the next game, it was, it was uh, Junio, Junio Pernambucano, who ended up at, at, at Leon, you know. And the next game, it's Junio Paulista. And you know, every game, you're thinking... And, and no one's heard of these players. This this, this is fantastic. So uh, no, I thought no, we, we, we're we're going to we're going to do this. We're going to we're going to do serious. We're going to do do this one seriously. Um, so I was writing stuff, and this is kind of pre-internet. So I'm, I'm either faxing it or or just sending off a mail pack, you know, to magazines and papers, trying to get something. Not getting very much, but from time to time, um, I think probably. Nike did me a big favor because they got involved with Brazil around 96 and that really increased the level of interest in the Brazilian national team. I'm before that. I don't, how, how old are you? I'm 30 years old. Right. Yeah. So before your time, um, in fact, up until the 1994 world cup, Brazil, certainly for an English supporter, but I would imagine for a supporter anywhere, Australia or anywhere, Brazil, they only turn up once every four years hmm. and that was the world cup. And uh, at, at the world, as the World Cup started, you didn't really know the players. And part of the greatness of the World Cup was that you got to know them during the tournament. Um, in 1998, that's different. Why? Because Nike have got involved. You know, Nike, first, they started off with basketball. And then they realized that the global game really was football. Uh, and they also did their homework and, and they realized, especially then, perhaps more so then than now, Brazil was everyone's second favorite team. So they had to have Brazil. So they signed Brazil with the idea of selling shirts all around the world. And they accompanied this with the unbelievably brilliant marketing exercises. So suddenly Brazil's everywhere. Brazil's everywhere. And I'm there to to, to report on that. You know, so suddenly there's more interest in the subject that, that I've that I've got to sell. And uh, 97 is, is the make or break year for me because if it hadn't have happened for me in 97 – there's no way I could have stayed in Brazil. I, I would have had to have, I couldn't have stayed. I would have had to have left. And suddenly in 97, everything happened for me. I got, I got into magazines. I got TV gig that got me into the BBC. Uh, and, uh, and really that, and that, that tide that I surfed in 97, I've been surfing it ever since. I do remember being eight years old and watching the airport commercial where Ronaldo and Roberto set, Carlos set, are playing yes. football through the airport. And it it gave you this uh, fantasy of Brazilian football and this image yeah. of the the laughter and the joy and the, the jinga of, of football. So I completely see what you're saying there. Yeah, but um, what, what they did and that they've been suffering a backlash for it ever since really is they oversold their products. Because the, the 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 commercials were much better than the football. 
you know, people held that up as as a measuring rod, and the football was all that 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 team played, and and even even when they won in two thousand and two, and and all subsequent teams, it's always been found wanting, and for that reason, I think there's been that's one of the reasons I think there's been a bit of a backlash against them. Really interested in your how you embrace the culture and the language because when i first went to brazil it, it was it rained on me that english is really not well spoken uh, yeah, so true. how you probably had to really immerse in the language and i'm really interested in those first few months how you approach that i had some i mean there aren't as i say there aren't that many things i can do but i'm quite good with languages it, it it's it's not difficult for me um so uh i remember that on that that three week trip i had in 93 that recce trip i'd had some kind of lessons with mates informal lessons with with mates and i had a little bit and three weeks of immersion when i was there and i came back and i remember walking along with one of my mates from the theater brazilian mate from the theater and we walk along having a chat and he suddenly stops and he says hang on a minute we speak in portuguese (laughs) Well, yeah, you know, picked some up, you know. So uh, I, I had I had a little bit, I had a little bit when when I, when I went to move over in '94. I could I could do a little bit, but it was it was still a shock for me because you know all my Brazilian mates in London, they had a, a a higher cultural level than the average Brazilian citizen, and they'd also been through the experience of speaking another language. So they knew they knew that to speak to a foreigner, you got to adjust your language and adjust the speed of your language and so on. And when I when I when I came here to live, you know, that's not the case with the, the majority of the Brazilian population. You know, they've never really spoken to you know, the vast majority. They've never really spoken to a foreigner and they don't really know how to do it. It's not their fault. You know, it's like the English. And the English are terrible. You know. Um, so uh, yeah, that meant you got to learn. And I, I, after you know, I've read the newspapers a lot. Uh, it meant that after about a week. I could say things like uh, uh, Savio is an injury doubt for Flamengo's game at the weekend, you know, which uh, was <laughs> didn't really help me buy things at the shops, but it was a start. <laughs> um, but I, I was also lucky that uh, I ended up, um, uh, what I really didn't want to do was recreate England in Brazil. You know, I didn't want to know, didn't really want to spend much, much time with, with, with English people or, you know, non-Brazilian people, you know, what's the point of that? Just stay in London for that. Um, so I, I lived, shared a flat with a, with a woman who didn't speak any English and she had lots of mates and none of them really, or very few of them spoke any English. So you're in there, you know, you're in there and, uh, it, there's no shortcuts with this and you've got to pick up the headaches and the headaches come from just having to concentrate, you know, on, on what's being said and when, where one word finishes and the other one starts. Teaching English was also a help because in the way that they're constructing English sentences, you, you get a little look into their mind, you know, because, all right, yeah, that's the way that they'd say it in Portuguese. So that 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 helped as well. So it, it, didn't, it didn't take that long and always, you know, if, 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 any, if anyone wants to wants to learn a language, then the the best way, the best way, get a woman who doesn't speak English, you know, get a, or a man, you know, whatever, whatever your, what your, your preference might be, but get a, a sexual partner who you can communicate, who like you can communicate with and who doesn't speak English. And then you're forced because if they speak English, you will always take the path of least resistance and it's not good. You know, you, you you've, you've got to get those headaches of going in the deep end and and coming out the other side um but uh, you know that's something that um, i i love doing it I, mean, I i pushed myself i remember uh this is around uh, 97 between about 97 and uh, and 2000 2000 i wrote a column in uh, in the in the sports paper here in in rio uh, it's no longer with us unfortunately but it was it was a really important sports paper at the time and it still had prestige at the time and i wrote a column a couple of times a week and uh you're forced then, you know, that, that. so I, I really pushed myself to do that. Uh, I was amazingly pushy. A young man on the, on the mic is a terrible, terrible thing. And I think about, and you know, you, you crash the offices of this newspaper and advertised your own services to write a column. I'd never do that now, you know, and, <laughs> no, but at the time I was, I was young and I was hungry and, and, and I wanted it. So that pushed me. And, uh, yeah, one of the things I'm proudest about, I suppose, is is the stuff I do on Brazilian TV every week. You know, and it and every time I do it, I'm thinking during the program, I'm thinking, yeah, this is a second language. You know, 
And obviously, it's it's not your first language. It, it's it's never going to be the same as, as as your first language. But still, um, that's uh, that, that that's a conquest, you know. Um, so going and doing that and being able to invade people's homes in Brazil and, and and talk to them in their language and 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 put things on the agenda that maybe wouldn't come from Brazilian journalists. That's that that's one of my happiest achievements, I think. I love to look into 97 and you said that was a massive year for you in terms of yeah. being able to um, make that step. How did you develop your voice and was your writing also in English and Portuguese those first few years? Yeah, well, I didn't do much writing in Portuguese. I, I did that column, um, uh, as I said, between 97 and, and, and maybe 2000, 2001, something like that. But it, that's short. That was about 400 words. So you only got one or two ideas to to sustain that. I did I did a column for BBC Brazil um, between two two thousand and fifteen and two thousand and eighteen. Yeah, I think three years. I did that column uh, once every two weeks. But that was about more weighty matters. You know, I'm writing about politics and society and and cultural things. That's hard work. You re- I really had to sweat that one out. Um, but I miss it. I enjoy doing it. Um, it was, uh, yeah, that, that, that was, that's, that's not the easiest way to earn money because, you know, and it, I've never actually formally studied the language. So, you know, the written word finds you out. So, uh, you know, one of my stepdaughters would have a look and, 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 uh, and, and correct it. Um, but that's, that's forced because, um, in, in, when you write in English and part of writing is, is linking, linking the passages, uh, and it's so easy, much easier to do that in a first language. You have the fluency. You'll find a bridge between one part and the next part. You'll you'll, you'll find a linguistic turn of phrase or a bridge. To do that in, in a second language is much, much harder. And what I found that meant was that I had to have the content more nailed down in Portuguese. Uh, and there's, I can't remember who the, who the, the phrase is. I, mean, I think it was a, uh, an English female writer who said, uh, I write to find out what I think. You know, and so she'd start and then on the way she'd discover the argument. You can't do that. I don't believe you can do that in a second language. You, you I had to have it more more nailed down. I wouldn't necessarily plan methodically, but I'd have to I'd have to have a clear idea of, of what I was trying to say. Um so it, it's it's much more restricting in a in, in a second language than, than it is, is in a first language. What made you stand out to the Brazilian public apart from just being the, let's say, exotic Englishman? No, it's a good question. Um, it's one I've, I've thought a lot about. And I think it, it's some of it is being a foreigner, um, but a lot of it is being a welfare state kid. It's a lot of it because it's something that is just not as prominent in in Brazil. You know, most of the journals, not all of them, but most of the journals are from middle class backgrounds. So there's there's that there's that distance straight away. There's that distance between the journalists and the players. Very very different social backgrounds, and, and my uh, my starting point for wherever I go is it's it's an, I suppose it's a natural sympathy for the underdog. You know, I, I was very lucky to be born at a time of social inclusion, and uh, everything that I've got really has come from the state. State housing, state education, as I said, paid for, even, you know, uh, university, state health and so on. Um, so that, that, that has given me a completely different perspective from, from the, the local journalists. So I think it, it, it's, it's that, that, that social factor that, that, um, that helps me stick out as well as specific, there are specifically football things as well. I mean, it, it's far easier for me to, to sit outside the nationalism that tends to tends to to dominate the, the debate about football in in Brazil. So you know, but that's about being a foreigner. Um, the thing about about the 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 role of the state in transforming my life possibilities that's something that I think differentiates me from from the vast majority of Brazilian journalists or the vast majority of prominent Brazilian journalists. And these days, I think probably from the vast majority of prominent English journalists, because that's unfortunately the way that things have gone. You mentioned something there that actually will make me bring forward one of my questions, and it was from Brian Glanville, who you you are like my Brian Glanville, I want to say, because you're that's very, very nice, influential yeah. for, for my generation. Um he did mention that there has been 
a growing disconnect between the journalist and the players. Did he say that? Yeah. Wow. And, yes, because that, that that's that's one of my things. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Go so on. How is how is that played on? How is that played out for you? Because he was saying that. Back in his day, he was able to go on the coach journeys with the players and develop a real relationship. Yeah. He knew Johan Cruyff really well. And then now the incomes are so high, it's been really difficult. Yeah. I, I, also, I think back in his day, I, it, it, doesn't, it applies less to him. And he's a hero of mine. I, I've got two, really. And he's one of them because he always put football in an international context. And, and uh, the other one is Hugh McIlvanny who always put it in a social context and you try and put those two together. And, and that, that's really what, what, what I've been trying, trying to do. Um, but in, in the day of Glanville, a lot of the journalists came from the same streets as the players. Um, so there, there was, there was a closeness right from the start. And obviously at those day in, in those days, the players weren't earning huge sums and they didn't have that, that corporate wall behind them. So there was a, they were all, they were kind of partners in crime, I think, in some ways. You know, when you hear about some of the things that went on when they were on tour, and you know, uh, and these days that's that that that's obviously that that that's very very different. Um, more of the players, perhaps the again, this is the way that society's gone. Perhaps more of the players in in England come from uh, backgrounds that you might call a, 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 as underclass. Um, and and the journos have become more middle class. Mm. The way that I see this play out in, in in Brazil, and it's something which infuriates me, is the player is so often treated as a figure of fun. He's 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 someone to be ridiculed. Um, and I, I think that that's entirely wrong. When he, he's he's ridiculed when he makes a mistake on the field, that's normal. That happens all the time. The ridicule of of the player. Um, but he's also ridiculed with um, the answers that he gives to to questions uh, when he's coming up straight off the pitch, or you know going out to the pitch. You know, and the questions are just these stupid questions, like you know, are you determined to win? You know, and yeah, how can you, you know, how can you be intelligent in 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 situations like that? So the the players almost the, the questions almost set up to make the players look look stupid. Um, but uh, so yeah, the, the strongest thing, and it, it's something I hammer on about Brazilian TV quite a lot, is this thing of turning the players into figures of fun. Um, you know, it's almost like the you know the start of boxing, where you know boxing was the the uh, the slaves fighting out in the middle for the the, the amusement of, of of the slave owners, and there's something of that. I think on, on Brazil is, is a society where where slavery has you know it, it was a, it was a society which had slavery until 1888. Um, and uh, has never really got over it. And part of that, I think, is is the way that the uh, the players are, are treated as as creatures to be ridiculed. And some of the things that happen when a player makes a mistake, some of the things that the commentators th- say, you know, they, they make a big big joke of it. I think that's really disrespectful, you know, because you know when the commentator is in the commentary box, there's no opposition in there. There's no one trying to get the microphone away from him. You know, and 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 yell in his ear, um, but that's not the same with the footballers. Uh, so uh, I, I hate that. Uh, I hate I hate the players being turned turned into creatures of ridicule. How do the Brazilian media or public even respond when you provide that insight to them and and a bit of a mirror to themselves? Unbelievably well, unbelievably well. I mean, I had problems when I started. Uh, and I, I had rejection when I started, and that's only to be expected. And you know, no particular problem with it. And you know, I still have people attacking me for being a foreigner. Social social media gives voices to uh, to, to all kinds of people, but in general, I, 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 I'm honestly astonished at the extent that I'm allowed to do what I do. Uh, and accepted and 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 respected or or, or whatever. I, I, I think it's amazing. I mean, it, it's at, at a time. It, it's nice that you reminded me about this actually, because at a time of you know, when there are plenty of reasons to feel despair for aspects of of, of this country. That 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 little thing has just reminded me that uh, there is a there is a a decency and a, and a tolerance um, in in the country. I, I want to go back on interviewing and silly questions. You've, I don't know who you've got to speak to or the, the list of names, but I assume that you've got to speak to some amazing footballers. How do you approach asking intelligent questions to them? 
I have to say, I'm uh, in this sense, I'm bone idle. I don't, I, I don't do very many these days interviews. Uh, I have done lots. Um, I, I did lots. You know, I was working for. Uh, I spent two or three years working, for, just for two or three days a year for a business conference called SoccerX that came over, and and uh, I would I would be interviewing all and all and sundry for 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 that. Well, everyone's got a story. You know, they've all they've they've all got stories. Obviously, I mean, doing some homework is is. I think you, I think you you've got to have an objective. What what are you trying to get out of of the interview? What what, what do you want to find out? Um, some of the ones I'm, that that particularly come to mind. When I did at Toshdown at length about playing with Pele. Uh, I did Mario Zagallo at length about being the coach of the 1970 side. Um, and and these are these are people who have done it. They've been there. So uh, how can you how can you get their story get their stories out? You know how can how can you speak as little as possible, but just nudge it in the direction of they they're going to tell you something that enables you to to have enough material to to, to shape a story. Um, so they're not they're obviously they, they can't be informal chats. Because you, you've got to you've got to have an objective. There's got there's got to be something that that you that you want to come out of it. But also you've got to leave it loose enough that you can be surprised, and that the conversation can go in in directions that that you never imagined. Because that can be really interesting as well. I want to go back onto Brazil, and I'm so glad that you wrote an article called uh, back in 2001 on Samba Foot. Brazil is not for beginners. And uh, it, for yeah, me, it's not preparing... my phrase. That, that that comes from that's that's Tom Jobim, the great bossa nova musician, who uh, who, who said that you know Brazil Brazil no no para iniciante Brazil is not for beginners. It, well, no, it's it, it's it's a complex complex country. And it, it was such a good insight before going to Brazil for the first time in my life uh, for the 2014 World Cup. Uh, a couple of quotes there was it's not as well, you actually said in the football factories that Brazil is not as bad as people say. It is worse in terms of the, the, the danger at that time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Another one was it's nowhere near as in, and nowhere near as enticing as the myth. It contains much less samba, but the real story is much more interesting. Yeah. So I was wondering, what is the real story of Brazil that well, you've discovered? Yeah, I mean, the, if we do that just, just in football terms, let's take the myth. And the myth is, and I have here, here's, here's something I prepared earlier. This is a very intelligent book from a very intelligent writer. This is How Soccer Explains the World by Frank Franklin Foyer. I don't know. I think that's how you say it. it, it it's a really intelligent book by uh, someone from the United States, very clever guy who's, who's come to football rel- relatively late and is, is, trying to, is trying to discover it uh, and, uh, and, and trying to explain it. Uh, and he comes out with all of the myths about Brazilian football, that it's a kind of carnival in boots um, where there is no emphasis on defense or on tactical schemes where everyone is trying to express themselves and, uh, you know, there's, and the result's not particularly important. Well, I have to say, couldn't be further wrong. Totally, totally wrong. Mm. Um, first, I mean, the, the number of people inside Brazilian football who've said the same to me, you know, deep down, Brazilians aren't not that keen on football. They just want to win. That's point number one. It's all about winning. Results, 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 results. I remember um, when the Barcelona Academy was producing fantastic uh, players. Um, I was over here at a conference of coaches and uh, in Rio, and they had the, the director of, of Barcelona's academy. And he was explaining the philosophy. And he said, right the way through, now why do we produce like Iniesta and, and these little guys? Because right the way through, we're not interested in results. That's true from the early stage, even to the Barcelona B team, you know, to play in the second, the second division. Results are not the objective. We're looking at the long-term development of players. And for an audience of Brazilian coaches, it's hard for them to do that. I mean, the then coach of the national team was Mano Menezes, and he got up and he said, that's great, but we're Brazilians. We, we, we can't be like that. You know, it, it, for us, it's all about the results. So, again, the idea that Brazilian football is this carnival in boots and everyone expressing themselves – 
totally wrong. Um, the the uh, the 1958 side, which may well be the best ever. It's it remains the only Brazilian side to have won in Europe. Certainly, man for man, I love I love 1970, but man for man, you probably pick more 58 players and 70 players. And the, on the 58 side, which is the one with Pele and Gahincha, so it's the most stereotypical Brazilian side that you've got. They play they played with a back four. No one had done that before. The extra player. We're drawn to the heart of the defence, giving defensive cover. They didn't concede a goal till the semi-finals, you know. So this most stereotypical Brazilian side, in fact, are uh, defensively very, very well organised with a really well determined tactical scheme, and it's that that gives them the platform to show their individual g- genius. Um, so, but uh, even in, even in the debate in Brazil, all of the hard work they did tactically and in terms of physical preparation tend it tends to get forgotten and what stays in the mind is the individual brilliance of 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 uh pele and gahincha uh, and uh that that's one of the reasons they've been struggling so badly for so long now they they kind of forgot the hard work that they did to make them the best um and uh you know in tactical terms they've been they've, they've, they've been overtaken they're not producing in a number of positions and they're, they're not producing players of, of the quality necessary in some positions they've got more than than, than more players than they need but in others you know they're, they're not producing and their domestic football is is of a, of a lamentable standard really compared with, with 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 what it should be um so all of those stories are fascinating because they contain a dynamic it, it, it's not like uh, there is there is a fixed thing. No, football doesn't move like that. Football is always evolving and always with relation. You know, it's revolving in relationship to society and so on. But there's that constant dynamic, and trying to trying to unlock the clues of that dynamic are, from a journalistic point of view, much much more interesting than just reproducing the same old static myths. When you watch football. How do you watch the game? And I'm alluding to, I read a book from Craig Froster, which is called Foz on Football, and he had a a passage there called The Matrix of Football. So sometimes fans can focus on that superficial layer above the surface when off the ball, there's so much happening. There's that that whole side of the game that's, that's going on that's even more fascinating than what's going on on the ball. So how what's the lens that you watch football with? Yeah, I think all lenses are are permissible. I mean, I, I don't think there is you know, any way that anyone gets any pleasure out of the activity for me is is absolutely fine, you know. Uh I think it becomes nerdy when you expect people to watch it one particular way. No, let people let people get whatever they want from it. Personally, the way that I do, and if if I'm watching, I've got to have pen and paper. And I've got to have a, a just a, a a thing with the basic tactical schemes there. So, you know, the four, one side's playing 4 2 three, one, the other's more of a 4 three, three. So I've got my tactical diagrams there. Um, uh, I've got to identify which are the left-footed players because that, that, um, that, that makes a huge difference. That, that opens out. If, and if you've got a side without a left-footed player, that's one, what's one flank of the field that they can't really use, you know. So that, that, that's something which I think is, is, is really important. And, and on the level of, of ideas... I want to try and see what are they trying to do? What, it, what, what is their objective here? Uh, so um, if, if I'm watching properly, I find, I find it quite tiring, actually, uh, if, if I'm watching properly, um, because I'm trying to engage on a, on a mental level and trying to get into that inside the heads of the coaches or whatever to try and make out what, the, what these teams are, are, are trying to do. Um, and and then you get the wonderful random nature of football where, you know, one little random thing and, and, and it changes the course, you know, I, and I love the fact that the same two sides can meet in two consecutive games and the result can be just totally, totally different. Even from the same pattern of basic pattern of the game, you, you can get, just get a completely different result. Um, so uh, I, I, I love that. I love that un- unpredictability, but, to try and you know to to write down the tactical schemes and and try and identify the, the the ideas that that gives me a kind of basic framework in in which to to, to make an attempt to understand the random nature of the result. 
I'd love to talk about the 2014 World Cup now because there's a couple of storylines I'd love to fuse together. One is the incredible campaign of Brazil and just how the pressure on those players' shoulders was so immense. And I guess anyone who was in Brazil at the time can appreciate the intensity of that. And then I'd love to speak to your actual working time during that tournament because was there the ability to enjoy yourself and enjoy watching games or was it that intensity of also having to work so hard too? No, it was just work. It, it was just work. I, mean, I, I didn't sleep. I, I enjoyed the work. I loved the work. But uh, uh, no, it, it's it's totally different from from enjoy it, from sitting and enjoying it. I mean, the last World Cup that I didn't work was USA 94 when I was still in England. And I was in London, and uh, London's such a great place to watch a World Cup because you can you can find the different atmospheres of, of, of the different people, you know, because there are so many nationalities there. So and that that was – I spent a lot of that World Cup doing that, you know, finding nice places to to, to watch the games and, and reveling in the atmosphere, and, and that really was enjoying it. Um, subsequent World Cups, no, it's, it, 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 it's work, you know, because – Every time you're you're writing an article, or you're broadcasting on the radio or the, or the TV, you want to have something to contribute, you know. And it, so it, it you want to be saying something that informs the reader or, or the viewer or the listener, and and gives him either some kind of context or some perspective or some information that he hasn't got. And that means work, and and uh, that's I feel that as a responsibility, you know. Um, I want to justify the time of of the, the the consumer, if you like, and the money of whoever's paying me. So it's um, it's 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 hard graft. It's, it's it, as I say, I find you watching the games is exhausting, and then then um writing about you're trying to make a little synthesis of that game that you you can fire off in in maybe 30 40 minutes afterwards something like that and you're trying to grasp some kind of truth of that game how can i how can i sum up the truth of that game in in uh within 40 minutes of the kickoff whatever um that, that that's work it's hard work mm. so uh yeah and uh, it was um it was an exhausting time although a very very enjoyable time in terms of brazil's campaign uh, what a story that was! I, mean, I only saw one of those games from inside the stadium, one Brazil game from inside the stadium, and it, it was the one that has been forgotten. But I think it's key to the whole thing, and that's the second game. Do you remember who the second game was against? I landed in Brazil in at halftime of the second game. Right. Yeah. Brazil versus Mexico, yes. nil nil. And I'll tell you why I think that was so important. Um, because the first game was was the Croatia game, and they didn't play well, and they needed a they needed a ridiculous penalty to win. They weren't particularly impressive. No worries. That's the debut game. Never judge any World Cup team on its debut game, especially the hosts with all that pressure. Okay. So all right, three points. No worries. Forget that one. The next one is Mexico. And they couldn't win, and they weren't particularly good. I mean, the the, the goalkeeper Ochoa made some good saves for Mexico, but you know, Mexico could have won it. And and uh, the the hubbub around the, the the press box was, Christ, you know, is this all they are? And I think that game is absolutely crucial because when when the team joined up in their training camp um, before the World Cup, start training for the World Cup. Remember, they've got Scolari as the coach and Carlos Alberto Pajera as the coordinator. That's two World Cup winning coaches. You know, so there's real experience there. And when they joined up, Pajera said, we have one hand on the World Cup. And that's honestly the way that they thought. They thought they were going to win the World Cup. After that second game, I think even then they're thinking, oh, we, we might not be good enough. And you start to see the start of the, of the psychological collapse happens there. You know, and, and, and it's a story of uh, um, the, the, the air in their hot air balloon suddenly going out all the way until that first half against Germany when, you know, the whole thing, the whole thing just absolutely collapses. But I think the, the process started in that second game against Mexico. 
The social context around it is so fascinating because that even goes back to even you could say the Confederations yeah, Cup definitely, in 2013. It's, that, that, that's a fundamental event in the political history of the nation, uh, what happened around the Confederations Cup. There's no, no, no doubt about it. And in fact, what went off in, in 2014 was nothing in, compared to, in comparison to what happened in, in 2013. The fears of the mass demonstrations, um, that they, they were mostly fears. It, it, it didn't go off as happened in, in, in 2013. But I would argue that 2013 is, is the start of what we're experiencing now. And it was so interesting because Brazil had played, played off the park a very good Spain team, winning 3-0 at the Maracanã. Um, it's the confeds the, it's the confeds yeah. you know the curse please. of the confeds yeah well it's not that serious is it you know and it, it, it's it's the it ain't the real thing i mean in during lockdown they've been playing some of these games you know on tv it's it's probably the only country that's been been watching games from the confederations cup you know but it ain't the real thing um after in a way you know uh, i had a, a a certain wry smile after the 7-1 because after that uh, confeds, that 3-0 win over Spain in the final in 2013, Julio Cerzo was the goalkeeper. He was, he, was, he was giving it large. He was saying, you know, what, what's, what's, because Spain were the world and European champions. You know, and he said, uh, what they have to realise is that football has a hierarchy. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and, uh, you know, as we're saying, football's a dynamic process. And after the 7-1, it had a new hierarchy. And Julio Cesar, not that it was really his fault, he becomes the goalkeeper who lets in seven goals in a World Cup. You know, doesn't matter what happened before. I do remember uh, really strongly the uh, the national anthems with the a cappella yeah. version in the last 30 seconds. They were pretty powerful memories. Uh, I'd love to just talk about, with your fans hat on, going to a World Cup final at the Maracanã because... You had been in Brazil for 20 years. You would always go to the Maracanã to watch yeah. local games. What was it like to just be able to enjoy an event that big, a World Cup final in your home, your new home city? Um, it, was, it was great. It was absolutely wonderful. I, you know, I was working the whole day and, 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 and most of the night as well. Um, but there was, first of all, there's, it's always great to be present when history is being made, you know, it's all, you know, I was there. So that, 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 that's always wonderful. Um, and it was a finish line as well. You know, I've, I've reached it, the finish line, because one of the things that's really striking with these, these events is like the next day, the media go because, you know, mm. they, they don't want to pay any more hotel bills and they have to pay. So, you know, suddenly it's a go town, which, which meant that I had to keep working for a fair few days afterwards because there's no one else there, you know, but, uh, you can, you can start coasting a little bit. And, um, I love, I love the whole day. In fact, one of the things I loved most was I came back from the stadium. I'd written, you know, I'd done the game. I'd written all my articles and, and, and done all my TV work and came back and, uh, I just crashed for a little while, not for very long because I then had to go to Copacabana to do, uh, to be on, on, it was BBC, it was world service who uh, from one of the beachside, um, little bar things they were, they were broadcasting and I was too, I was so tired. I do I really want to go, uh, and you know, let's do it. You know, it's, it's work. Um, so uh, I went and I was so glad that I did because everyone was there, you know, and, and until they went to bed, the World Cup was still a live event. Mm -hmm. It was still the World Cup. You know, when you wake up the next morning, the Monday morning, the World Cup is history. But while you're awake and while you're wandering up and down the main main drag at Copacabana, the World Cup is still a live event. Uh, and uh, that that's something I, I, I love. I mean, that, that aspect of bringing the world together. And the, the Argentines, the, 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 fan, the Argentine fans were the, the, the big highlight of the whole thing. Um, but you know, they were, they were charging up and down, singing their songs. Didn't matter that they'd lost, you know, when I mean, they obviously they weren't very happy about losing, but, uh, you know, they're still singing and there's still the atmosphere and it, it, it's still great. So that, that little thing, I probably remember that with even fonder memories than, than, than of being in the stadium for the game. Cause that just seemed to be the spirit of the world cup. You know, as long as we don't go to bed, the world cup is still, is still alive. Football, you've said, is not just what you do, but how you do yeah. it. What 
What football style or approaches do you enjoy observing the most? Well, uh, I- Back back to to my dad, who as I said was was a was a was a Tottenham fan. What made him a Tottenham fan, to the extent that he was a fan, was passing football, was uh, creative passing football, looking to manoeuvre the ball, making the ball do the work. Uh, so that that that's the style that I grew up with. And my old man loved the Liverpool side of the of the the late seventies, early eighties, who were like a machine like that. So um, that 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 means that, uh, and one of the great things about football is it can be interpreted in in so many different ways. And who's to say that any any one style is is right? But I love passing football. I loved the Colombia of Carlos Valderrama, for example, that Colombia side late eighties, early nineties. Uh, and uh, the biggest vindication I've ever had was um, Guardiola's Barcelona, um, which it, it, it's easily forgotten now, but. When it's when he started, just how revolutionary that was. Um, and at that time, the idea that you, that you could you could win with little midfielders was really unfashionable. Everyone was bulking up, uh, and 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 so to see what they did was was a mag- was for me a, re- a a magnificent vindication of the type of football that that I've always appreciated. I don't think we could complete this interview without even speaking about the BBC World Football phone-in. Such an amazing community and the interaction with the listeners, and now we're we're very much missing it. Yeah, so I would I. love to go back to. I would love to talk about uh, before my day and what were the beginnings like for that show and uh, its origins. And you were very much involved in that. Yeah, well, it was me. It was my little slot. Um, I got on the as I was saying. I got in, into the BBC World Service. Um, in the middle of, of 97. Uh, so uh, on their news bulletins that they had then, I was often doing like, you know, 45 second to one minute voice pieces on, you know, what was going on in, in South American football. Um, Radio 5, someone at Radio 5 heard that. And and uh, the, the, the nighttime show called Up All Night, it had just started. So they had these extra hours of, of, of programming. So, um, they got in touch and, and uh, said, well, can you do a, a quick roundup of South American football? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So uh, I did that. It was December of, uh, of, of 97. And I had no idea that they wanted me to do it every week. I thought, yeah, it's end of the year roundup. And then they phoned the next week and said, well, can you do it again? Yeah, sure. All right, we'll do it again. And um, it was uh, just a five-minute slot that became a 10 minute slot and then sometimes 15 because you know they began to get a good response from from the audience um so we would, we were doing that for for a few years and then i think it was uh 2002 um they got in touch and they said uh, what do you think we're thinking about making this um interactive instead of like a 15 minute slot we're thinking about making this an hour long with uh, a kind of phone in thing what do you think? And I said, nah, not a hope. There's no way. You know, we're not going to have an audience. <laughs> You're wasting the time. Uh, and so they completely disregarded that opinion. Thank God. And uh, <laughs> one day the next year, 2003, I came through to do what I thought would be my usual 15-minute slot. And uh, they said, oh, no, it's a, it's an, it's a phone-in. It's, it, it's an interactive phone-in. It's, it's, it's an hour this week. Hadn't, hadn't anyone told you? And no. And one thing um, you learn about if you work, spend any time in the communications industry is that it communicates internally very, very badly indeed. So I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that we would, instead of a 15-minute slot, we were doing an hour phone-in. But we did. Uh, and uh, uh, it kept growing. And we went from an hour to an hour and a half and then then to, to two hours. And it, it, you know, there there have been times. I'm not for a long time now, but there have been times when I was thinking that this, this formula surely has reached, you know, it, it's it's reached the end. But it never does. You know, it just seems to get better and better and and uh, and, and and stronger and stronger. And I'm really missing it at the moment. I mean, it's uh, it, it's not on at the moment. I think, as far as I can understand, because as I say, the communications industry doesn't do a lot of communication. Uh, it, it's a kind of administrative pro uh, problem that we have at the moment. In that. It, the show is part of this up all night, which feels four hours 
Um, and you know, on, on a, a Friday night, we fill two hours of those four, but that whole up all night is not on. And, and the, the world football phoning doesn't stand independent of up all night. It's part of the programming of up all night, but because of the coronavirus and because of limitations about the number of people they can get into studios, the whole up all night isn't on, which means that, 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 that we're not, not on, but I look at it now as it, it's probably, um, the the crowning achievement of what I ludicrously call my career, you know, being at the center or one of the centers of, of this community that, that brings people in. It makes them feel included. Uh, I love the fact that we can, well, first of all, and let's, I mean, I've been very, very lucky with presenters and the fellow, when it was just a five, 10 minute slot, it was a fellow called Richard Dallin who saw that it was getting a reaction and encouraged it. And that was that was important to get it off the ground. And then um, we went to when we went interactive, it was Anita, Anita Anand, who uh, not a sports specialist at all, but a lovely, warm touch who really helped that transition to uh, to a phone in. And then then Dotton, you know, and and uh, he, he's uh, Uncle D and he's he's brought he's brought so much and uh uh, he's such a great phoning, a truly, truly great phoning host. Um, and and the thing that I, I absolutely love about it is that we can go from the really, really stupid and silly and trivial to the really serious. Uh, and I love that. And I love the fact that that um, that people can be attracted to either side or all of that, and that lots of people who don't like football like the show. Um, and that, that, that's always a, a compliment to, to it as well. And, and just the fact that it, it, it makes people feel included. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that, that's, um, that's, uh, that is, I think that that's being, being part of that is, is the best thing I've ever done. And how have you reflected through this, this period at the moment on life in general now in, in terms of football and, and what you would like to achieve in this, in this industry to, to go? All of my, I've done all, I've done it all, frankly. I, I don't have any more ambitions. I've, I've done it all. Um, so, uh, to keep doing it for as long as I, long as I'm enjoying it, which means as long as I feel that I've got something to contribute, um, with, and personally, I, I, I tend to think that either I'm busy or I'm lazy. Uh, and, uh, if, if, if I'm not busy, my mind just clogs up and I need the street and it's something that I'm really missing at the moment. You know, I, I draw energy off the street and cause I'm not spending any time on the street, you know, just sitting, having a cafe, having a coffee, watching the world go by, you know, um, I lose something mentally. So, uh, I, I, I fear I might've lost some, some mental sharpness, just some, but that, that'll, that'll come back. Um, clearly, uh, so on, I've spent this this time. Well, I've lost quite a lot of work, but I haven't lost all of it. So um, when I'm working, I, I spend a lot of time trying to think of, of of angles for articles. Is that that thing we were talking about earlier on? Of every time you write or something, you you've got to try and justify the time of of the consumer and the money of whoever's paying you. Uh, so. <laughs> That, that's that been torturing me a little bit. You know, how on earth can I come up with a, these people are paying me good money? How, how can I give them value for money? What, what, what can I do? What article can I, can I do? How can I, how can I put out some content that might be, that, that, that might be interesting, which I don't actually find relaxing. Uh, I, f- I find that, uh, I find that responsibility, it's a responsibility I could do without. Um, but you know, when I'm like that, at least it stops me being lazy. Cause if not, I'll just, just kind of drift off and listen to my same old records again and, uh, and, and look out the window. Um, so, uh, it's, it, it, it's been a challenge and I'm very, very lucky in that I have a beautiful flat with lovely views and this space. So if, if you're going to be closed off in, you know, and spend a lot of time at home, I've, I've got, a, I've got a lovely home in which to do it, which is a luxury that, that millions don't have. If we can talk about Brazil right now, um, at the time of recording this, there's a lot of news about uh, the the pandemic and how it's hit Brazil. Unfortunately, tell us about what it's like being there and um, in Rio de Janeiro well, it, right now. It's always an enemy that you can't see, isn't it? So that 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 makes it easy to take the thing too lightly. I and mean, I think 
Yeah, in the future, there will be mini series and so on on Brazilian TV about the absolute disaster that has been the political response to this. It's always going to be difficult, Brooke, because Brazil is complex. You know, it's a it's a giant country. It's a country of continental dimensions. And once the virus gets in, some of the poor areas, people are living together in such close proximity that it's it's very very hard to control. Um, but as we speak. The death toll is rising at a thousand a day, and it's uh, it's looking towards twenty five thousand. And there's no no prospects of a decline in that. In fact, we're not talking about thinking of a peak; we're thinking about a plateau. You know, uh, and uh, but they're they're going to reopen lots of stuff. You know, just because there's so much political pressure to do it, so it's kind of reopening before the curve has been flattened. Um, so the, 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 these are very very worrying times. Um, the uh, the central government, I think, is just a, it's a byword in lunacy and incompetence. Uh, we got to see because of some of the political infighting um, a, a, a government meeting, the meeting of all the ministers. Um, this was April twenty second. So the consequences of what happened in April, uh, around that time are reflected in the the death toll today, and it's a two hour meeting, and and President Bolsonaro and his ministers. You would think. That coronavirus, the biggest epidemic to have hit in a in a century, you would think they may just a little bit uh, give some of their attention to what they're going to do. They just don't care. There's nothing there at all. You know, they're not they're not interested. Um, the president, who is this, is a government of right wing lunatics, uh, and uh, he's saying that so the social distancing measures, which have been imposed by the state governors, Brazil is divided into states, so it's the state governors and not the central government who've taken responsibility for social distancing measures. And he's saying that these social distancing measures have been imposed for ideological reasons, in other words, in his mind, um, in order to impose communism, because they see communism everywhere. They're like Japanese soldiers who are still fighting the Second World War thirty years after after it's over. Um, and it's just it, it's lunacy. It it is. The country is being run at the moment by absolute lunatics. And um, one of my hopes now is that and Brazil, I think, is on the way to being an international outcast. And even Trump, who's a big Bolsonaro ally, has, has, has banned Brazil, people from Brazil from going to the United States and fly, flying to, to, to the States because um, the uh, the coronavirus, there's no signs of it coming under, under, under control at all. And you kind of hope that international pressure might have some, might, might, might shift uh, you know, and just the fact that business people will lose money from this, you know, um, but at the moment it's very, very bleak indeed. Really, really bleak. It's it, it, it's sickeningly bleak. The lunacy and the incompetence of the people who are running the place. This whole situation has made me think a lot about uh, since I work in sport. Uh, a quote that you actually mentioned, which was, um, "Of all the unimportant things in life, football is the mo- yeah. most important." How do you reflect on football's role in, in this really situation? a good question. And it, it's on football in Brazil at the moment is a political football because uh, well before there's any sign of the curve being flattened, lots of efforts to get football back, um, which means that there's real fighting between the clubs. And Flamengo last week, they went to see President Bolsonaro to, to, to try and pull the levers to hope he can, he can get to help get football back. Botafogo, one of their real real rivals, are saying that 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 that's that's a case of homicide. Uh, Corinthians have just come out with a really good uh, statement, saying that you know you can't even think of it before you've con- brought the virus under some kind of control. You can't think of bringing football back. You know it's not essential. Back to that to that that wonderful quote, you know, which which I got from from uh, from the press here. That you know, of all the the unimportant things in life, that's you know, it, it may be the most important of them, but it, it it's still, uh, and to put the players under that kind of pressure. And the thing that, that's heartbreaking from from the point of view of Flamengo is uh, a couple of weeks ago, their massage specialist of forty years, Jorginho, he died of coronavirus. Uh, he was with the national team when they won the two thousand and two World Cup. You know, he's been he's been Flamengo's massage guy since nineteen eighty. He's died of coronavirus. And they're still pushing football to come back. Now, in the case of Flamengo, they're rich. They've got the resources to do, carry out lots of tests and so on. But you can't play football on your own. You know, it, it, it's you, you need you need other teams. And, and until the virus is brought under control and, and, and you have a sense that it's safe, not only for the players, but for everyone with whom the players come into, come, come into contact, 
then I, I think it, it's it, it's premature to uh, to even think about 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 the game coming back. Tim, this has been a wonderfully insightful conversation. Um, really have appreciated it. Would love to finish with two more questions. Okay. Um, this one is around. You, you showed us one of the books that you prepared earlier before, but I wonder if you have one to three books that have greatly influenced you in your life. Well, the the, the one. When if if I had to take one to a desert island, it would be uh, a book by by someone who actually grew up in Australia, although he's he's English born. He's a fellow called Colin McInnes. Uh, it's called Absolute Beginners, uh, and it was written in '59 um, about a little bit the, the the Notting Hill race riots in England in '58. But it's a, it's about the the birth of a, of a new teenage. Uh, the, the the concept of the teenager had never been around before, um, but the new teenager who can who's free enough to build his own identity, uh, and uh, I I read it again and again and again. I absolutely love it. And one of the things that's only just hit me about the book in the last couple of years is that, because uh, I discovered this when I was about 18, that the, 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 the character, the, the narrator, he tries to go to Brazil. That's his aim at the end of the book. He doesn't make it, but he, you know, so I've kind of lived out that, that, that dream for him. You know, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've done it for him. But it, it's, a, it's a book about a specific time and place, but it's about creating your own identity. Um, and, uh, I've, I've, I find it I've, every time I read it, it, it carries me and makes, makes me, uh, it, it gets me, gets me inspired. I read a lot of social history. Um, I love social history. Uh, there's a series of books by an English historian called David Kiniston, which covers 1945 to 1979. They're huge books, each for about three of the year, four or five of the years. And uh, I've just been rereading those through, during the lockdown. But, uh, the last, he's taken us up to 1962, and that was about five years ago. We've had nothing since. So I want the next one. I want the next one because he's left us at 62. Everything that's great is just about to start. You know, the Beatles are just about to start. The first James Bond film is just going to come out. Everything that's great, sex is just about to be invented, you know. Um, so please. So uh, I love those th- those history books from David Kiniston. Uh, and uh, so my favorite book is the next one that he hasn't released yet. So please, if you have any interest, if, any, if anyone listens to this and knows David Kiniston, then get, tell him to get his finger out and, r- and write the uh, write the next one. Tim, as someone who loves hearing your football wisdom and often it, it has a social context as well, I'm sure the listeners would appreciate to know if you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere in the world with something written on it so millions or billions could see, what would it say and and why? Well, I haven't really got any, who am I? So I haven't really got any great message for humanity, you know. So it would probably be just something very, very simple like, um, can't we do this better? I think that would be it, because that's what I think all the time. You know, can't we can't we do this better? Is, it, is there not a better way that we can do this? Um, so I think it would just be that, really. You know, there are lots of little quotes that I have for myself about the way that that, that I want to live my life. But in in terms of a great message for humanity, that's it. You know, and it, it sounds a bit banal to just say, you know, be be kind to each other. But you know, can't we do this better? Because uh, I'm sure we can. You know. And and hope well, maybe now that with the with the pause for the the, the the coronavirus, maybe people have got have got more of a chance to think about you know maybe we can do this better. Tim, thank you so much for your time. This has been a wonderful conversation, and I would love to extend the inv- invitation to you when all the restrictions have hopefully passed. That you come to Fremantle, and we can. You can shoot the breeze and you can experience the Fremantle Doctor yourself one day. Yeah, I'd love to have the, uh, the, the Fremantle Doctor. Is that the Vulture Street End or is that another cricket ground in in, uh, in, in Australia? Is that's that the Vulture one. Street End? Yeah, it's a different one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got the Wacker Ground here, the uh, West uh-huh. Australian Cricket Association, where Terry Alderman, uh, one of your relatives, that's it. That's was it, a, yeah. a great bowler for a long time. What, what are the ends there? Can you remember what the ends are, the Wacker? Uh, we've got the Prindival End and the Lily Marsh yeah. Stand End. Uh huh. The yeah. Willie Marsh stand in. Yeah, that's any Englishman of my generation that puts the hairs on a you know because you were scared of him. You're scared of Lily. You know, scared of uh, Lily's Lily's Perth and he's Western Australian. He is. Yes. Oh, well. uh, named after Dennis Lily and Jeff Marsh. Rodney Marsh. I remember it's wouldn't it be Rodney Marsh? That's wicket it. Keeper. Uh, that Marsh family, and then now we've got a new stadium. So the Perth Stadium is visible from the Wacker Ground. 
And oh, that's right. where a lot of the big test matches are going now. And unfortunately, the Wacker is more for the, the regional competitions. And you got Perth glory as well. We sure do. <laughs> Tim, absolute pleasure. Take care and all the best to you and your family. My pleasure. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Hey there, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for listening to Frio de Janeiro. I'd love to invite you over to the show website, bitimam.com. That's where you can get all of the show goodies and the notes from every episode. Until next time, keep smiling and keep scoring. <laughs>